Thanks, Rainer, for this exaggeration. Um, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure for me uh, to be back again in, in Bangkok. And I, I should say uh, that uh, um, already almost two years ago, in May 2018, uh, we were here and uh, again, Grace uh, was the main person from UNICEF. Uh, who said uh, that, um, yeah, the global study to be financed out of voluntary contribution was not that lucky uh, in receiving enough, uh, enough funds from governments. Uh, so we fall in and we assist you in uh, organizing a regional consultation in the Asia-Pacific uh, region, which was a very successful one with many government representatives and feeding into the global study and uh, we had similar other regional consultations in, 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 in other cities. So I'm very grateful <coughs> on the one hand uh, to UNICEF uh, uh, for having organized a two days workshop uh, on Monday and Tuesday of this week um, where we or you brought together uh, representatives from seven states in the region uh, to tell us also your experiences and to interact with you in order to do what we need to do, and that is to bring the global study to the ground. Now it's the time for the implementation of our recommendations, and I was very happy to see how much work was put into drafting ideas, what could be done in order to finally have national action plans uh, in order to implement the study. <coughs> uh, on the other hand, I am extremely grateful uh, to uh, Monica and uh, all the others, whether it's Alex, uh, Kasia Stina from the Right Livelihood Foundation, uh, that you are celebrating and uh, you have really a good reason to celebrate 40 years of the Right Livelihood Foundation uh, and uh, you have um, produced so many laureates from all world regions which are who are really the people on the ground who do the work for sustainability, ecology, but also human rights. And uh, I think it's a beautiful cooperation uh, that we have partnership agreement uh, that we uh, developed in a very short period of time, about one year ago, between the Right Livelihood Foundation and the Global Campus of Human Rights in order to introduce children's rights the rights of future generations into all our activities. And uh, the Global Campus of Human Rights has quite many activities. We have, for instance, seven master programs. One is here, the Asia Pacific Master Program, based at Maidol University, um, and uh, uh, to mainstream children's rights into all those different activities. Uh, but it goes far beyond uh, then the, the seven master programs, uh, we do many other events, conferences, and we really have now a very strong focus on children's rights, and for that I'm very grateful to the Right Livelihood Foundation. Of course, I mentioned already my Doll University, uh, and I'm very happy that the director of the Institute for Human Rights and Peace is with us today, but also Mike and uh, Christana and all the others uh, from uh, Mahidul University, which is a very, very active and important partner of one of our hundred universities, but one of the coordinating universities here, coordinating the Asia Pacific uh, Master. Also, many thanks to you for having organized this lounge, regional lounge, sub regional lounge of the global study in between two major events the UNICEF workshop and the Right Livelihood 40 years celebration. That brings me to the main um, kind of the, the background but the main conclusions and recommendations of the global study and I'm, I'm very happy I should also say that uh, we were able to link a global study which is a United Nations study. It is done uh, for the United Nations and by the United Nations. Uh, I was simply not the godfather, I was simply the, the face uh, of it because it was a joint activity of so many different people. 
uh, non-governmental organizations, but also academia, so that I could link the global study with the global campus of human rights, which is the biggest network of universities in the world dedicated to human rights and democracy. Um, and that uh, is, uh, I think, a very, a very important uh, coincidence, bringing that together. Um, deprivation of liberty is deprivation of childhood. That is one of our uh, slogans that came out of the global study after we have interviewed 274 children in 22 different countries trying to capture their experiences and we have spoken to so many kids that spent most of their childhood somewhere behind bars it might start somewhere in an orphanage and again um, as we know about 80 percent of the children in orphanages worldwide still do have parents or at least one parent so it's not necessary to be in an orphanage. They are simply sent there because of many different reasons. It would be much more important to support the families in order to keep their children and also be able uh, to, to take care um, of, of their children. Uh, and then they were sent from one to the other uh, because they might have learning disabilities, learning difficulties, they might have uh, then um, they need uh, educational supervision, so they go from one of those children's homes to the other. And at a certain time, they are running away, they are living in the streets, they are picked up by the police, they might even have been stealing something in order to survive, and finally they end up in the criminal justice system um, and spend most of their time uh, in, in some kind of closed institutions um, that are not healthy uh, for the upbringing and development of the child. It's, it's their formative years that they have lost and they have lost their, their, their childhood. Uh, what they need is love. I think that's the most important. And love you don't find in an institution. Uh, you are not able to bond. You need it in a family. Ideally your own family that needs to be supported by the child welfare system, by the states. Um, but if your own family is really not existent or not able, then it should be a foster family or a family type setting, but not an institution uh, where you find love, protection and uh, security. And putting children behind bars is counterproductive. First of all, it's much more expensive. Also from an economical point of view, it's the, the worst uh, option uh, for, for children. Uh, it damages the health of children and leaves a, um, a, a mark not only on their lives but also on societies uh, where children are put away behind bars. This global study is the third one in a row. Croissa Magel in 1996 published her famous report on children in armed conflict which had a major impact also on the Security Council of the United Nations to tackle the problem of child soldiers. Um, and much has been achieved in the meantime. There is a special representative for the Secretary General uh, on children and armed conflict. Uh, and it's on the agenda, not only of the Security Council, uh, of so many different bodies in order to fight uh, the phenomenon of child soldiers. Ten years later, the Brazilian expert, Paulo Sergio Pinheiro, um, was asked to uh, lead the global study on violence against children. And again, it had a major impact on our awareness that violence, whether it's physical, mental, sexual, or verbal, any other violence, is simply unacceptable against children. Uh, and it had an impact. Again, we have an SIHG on violence against children. Many states in these 13, 14 years after the publication of the study have enacted new laws to fight violence in the family, violence in schools, etc. Um, and at that time already became clear that deprivation of liberty 
is simply a structural form of violence against children. Uh, so it's a logical third global study following from the one on violence against children to tackle one of the issues that is very clear in the convention, but in reality it has been overlooked. It's one of the most overlooked aspects of violence against children is to put them behind bars. So that's why on the initiative of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and on the pressure of the NGO community. Without the NGO community, we wouldn't have these global studies. Uh, that finally in 2014, the General Assembly, I should say a little bit reluctantly, uh, requested the Secretary General of the United Nations, at that time Ban Ki-moon, uh, to commission another global study on violence against children. We have an interagency task force and I have had the privilege to be, um, to be appointed in 2016 to lead the, this uh, third global study, which I uh, finally presented to uh, the General Assembly in October in New York uh, as a small typical UN document of 27 pages is uh, the summary uh, because the real report, the real study was not yet ready. We worked days and nights in October, September, October, November. Many of us, uh, uh, including Reina, including Lucas uh, Mano, who cannot be with us now, uh, to really finalize it and having it in a printed and also in an online version ready to be submitted to the United Nations in Geneva in November of last year. Now, why do we need a global study? As has been said already, the convention is very, very clear. Article 37b states, deprivation of liberty of children can only be a measure of last resort. Now, last resort means you have to try everything else, all other non-custodial solutions. It can only be an exception. Adults may be deprived of liberty for criminal justice reasons or other reasons. Children should not be deprived of liberty. That's a totally different message. And if it's absolutely necessary, then only for the shortest appropriate period of time. Now, the Convention is very clear, and of course, together with the other principles, it should always be in the best interest of the child. Deprivation of liberty is more or less never in the best interest of the child. Uh, in reality, of course, there are too many children deprived of liberty around the globe, uh, but we don't really know how many. There were no reliable statistical data, and there still are no reliable data today. Uh, UNICEF, the only figure that was kind of always again cited was an old UNICEF figure from the 1990s, about one million children. Uh, but it uh, referred primarily to uh, the administration of criminal justice. Uh, so this is the first study that really looked into the magnitude of the problem. <coughs> and we looked at six key focus areas. Um, the one starting from the left and the bottom, the administration of justice. Uh, that's a photo I took when I was um, special rapporteur on torture in Togo, in a children's prison in Togo, because the minimum age of criminal responsibility was seven years. So you have eight, nine year old children that are already sentenced to a prison term for I don't know, stealing or doing some kind of minor crimes uh, and being locked away in a cell. Um, closely related national security grounds, uh, suspects of terrorism, think about ISIS, etc. Um, then uh, in the middle down, children living in prisons with their primary caregivers, which means usually mothers, uh, if there is no alternative that nobody else takes care of the kids. In armed conflict, and then, for migration-related reasons, uh, um, children together with their families or unaccompanied children are often put uh, also for long periods in migration detention. 
and uh, finally uh, many types of different institutions um, from orphanages to institutions for children with disabilities, uh, psychiatric hospitals, etc., where children are uh, deprived of liberty. And then we had four cross-cutting cross areas, um, the one on children with disabilities, the whole gender dimension, um, the University of Melbourne was leading uh, a, a global, another global study on the impact on health, reviewing thousands of peer-reviewed uh, journal articles on the impact of deprivation of liberty on the mental and physical health of children. And as I said, we interviewed um, 274 children in 22 countries to capture their own experiences and their own views. As I said, it is a real joint effort, um, on the one hand with member states. This is not uh, a naming and shaming exercise. It's not an investigation and then, uh, and then to, to, to name states in order to shame them, not. It is a joint exercise and the states are the major stakeholders. We developed a questionnaire that was sent to all UN member states, but also to national human rights institutions, national preventive mechanisms, to ombuds institutions, to non-governmental organizations, UN agencies. Um, and we got uh, not every state replying, but quite many did actually. Um, and we got 118 replies relating to 67 states. That's uh, about one third um, of the UN uh, membership. Um, as I said, uh, the GA said it needs to be paid out of voluntary contributions and only a handful of states actually were contributing. I'm very grateful for these states that are named here together with the European Union and also UNICEF. Uh, but uh, as Reina already has said, without we got actually finally more money from private foundations that saved the global study, more money than from all the states together. Uh, without that, we wouldn't have been able to finalize the study and we would not be able to now disseminate the results of the global study in these events like today. Um, I was led by an UN interagency task force. The two special representatives of the Secretary General uh, were parts of that. Uh, Marta Santos Pais, the former um, SI she on violence against children, was for a long time the chair of the, of the task force. Uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNICEF, the High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, the Office for Drugs and Crime in Vienna, IOM, WHO, and the CRC Committee. So all the main UN agencies uh, were part, active part, of the, uh, the study, also the different research groups. We have an advisory board of 22 high-level experts, and I'm extremely happy that one of them, Vitit uh, Munterborn, uh, my good friend, and I see him here, behind his mask uh, sitting, who will also give us the final speech today, uh, is a member of, the, um, of this advisory board, which is chaired by Hans Kelton from the University of Pretoria and a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. We have 170 non-governmental organizations. And again, I cannot stress it more. Without the active impact of NGOs, again, this study would not have been possible led by Defense for Children International and Human Rights Watch uh, and, and, and many other very active um, NGOs. Academia, as I said, uh, particularly the Global Campus of Human Rights um, and uh, different research groups and my, the, the institute that I founded in Vienna, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, finally took over the whole coordination of the global study from the office of the High Commissioner for human rights. So that gives you a little bit an overview uh, to what extent, uh, if you take all the different NGOs, research leads, etc. So it was really a global exercise uh, that we were able to put together. Now, coming to the findings and conclusions, uh, and there I have to make um, an explanation 
uh, because we had to follow <coughs> the definition of deprivation of liberty from international law. That means the Havana principles, but in particular uh, the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. And that clearly says deprivation of liberty means if you are detained in a, uh, in a, in a room, in a house, etc., but by a decision of a governmental authority, a court or an administrative agency, by or at the instigation with the acquisition. So there must be some kind of link to the government. And that's what we call de jure deprivation of liberty. Now, if you look, uh, for instance, at immigration detention, that's clear. Every person detained uh, because of irregular entry into a country or because of deportation is detained by the formal decision of a governmental authority. There's no question. Uh, the same is with national security, etc., armed conflict. In the administration of justice, uh, this 410,000, and that is a, a lower number than UNICEF originally um, assessed uh, with this 1 million, that is relating to pretrial detention and post-trial detention, imprisonment. And that is, of course, a decision by a court. But many more kids on an annual basis are arrested and deprived of liberty by the police. And that's very often without any kind of formal decision. And in all those statistics, this uh, police custody is not included. Uh, so that's why we call it de facto deprivation of liberty. Very often the formal deprivation is only after they have been brought to the police station and finally the child has seen, uh, or at least it was authorized by a judicial authority or at least a prosecutor. So that's why you have this big difference between 410,000 and about roughly one million children per annum deprived of liberty by the police. But the biggest difference you see in institutions, of course, if a court decides that your parents are not able, there's, there's a lot of violence in the, in the family, they are uh, drug users and cannot take care of your child, and you are formally taken away from your parents and put into an institution, then this is the jure deprivation of liberty in an institution. And these are about the 670,000. But most children in institutions have not been taken away by a judicial or other government authority decision. It's very often that parents, for instance, parents of children with disabilities, simply feel they cannot handle their children and they bring them voluntarily to very often a private institution. Um, and there's no real governmental decision. For the child, it doesn't make a difference. So that's why we felt we also have to take all these children into account that are in institutions. And institutions are defined in a, in, in a very specific way. We are not talking about small family type settings, small group homes in the community. We are talking more about these big institutions with certain characteristics. Um, and, uh, and that's where, according to a most recent study that we have commissioned, it's about 5.4 million children that are in institutions. And according to the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations, we can consider them as being de facto deprived of liberty. And that means that altogether, we are talking about more than 7 million children worldwide currently per annum deprived of their liberty. And that's uh, a, a much higher figure than the 1 million from UNICEF or the 1.5 million the euro deprived of liberty. Now, I go quickly through the different six settings. Um, I said that already. Uh, institutions are inherently harmful to children. There's a lot of medical evidence uh, that uh, is uh, corroborating that uh, since the conditions are characterized by usually strict discipline, it's not, it's 
the, ins the, the, the interest of the institutions are much more important than the individual needs of children, lack of love, there's a lot of violence, there are many studies about sexual misconduct in, in, in both rich and poor countries uh, that children suffered and still suffer. So that's why the main recommendation is deinstitutionalization. And that is in line with the United Nations General Assembly um, resolutions um, and guidelines on the alternative care of children. In the administration of justice, as I said, uh, the, the number uh, probably came down because there is more and more awareness of states that you need a specialized child justice system with special child courts, special, specially trained police officers dealing with children, prosecutors, judges, and also prison administration. Um, so that we have uh, more diversion, and that is the main recommendation, that uh, in the child justice system, uh, children should be diverted already. It can be by the police, can be by the prosecutors, by the judges, or even after they have been sentenced uh, by the prison administration. Other root causes are tough on crime policies in, in many countries, the criminalization also of status offenses like truancy, running away from school, um, voluntary uh, sexual uh, relations between teenagers, etc. Um, and of course a low age of criminal responsibility, whereas the Committee on the Rights of the Child clearly says um, the minimum age should never be below 14 years of age. There are still 120 states that are below that age, and as I said, there are still countries uh, as low as seven years or even less. Um, so that's why uh, there's a lot of corruption uh, there, there uh, and, and also not enough interagency cooperation between the administration of justice, the different, uh, the different factors of the administration of justice on the one hand with the child welfare system, the health system, the education system, etc. We need a much better interaction also with social workers when we are dealing with children that are in conflict with the law. Closely related to that is children that are living with their primary caregivers, and that means to 99.9% .9 is women, um, so that women who are sentenced to a prison term um, often, if they have small children, infants, um, want to take them uh, into prison with them because there's no alternative. If there's a father who can take care of the child or grandparents or other members of the extended family, uh, that is of course better in the better interest of the child. If the alternative would be to put this child into uh, an, an orphanage or another type of institution, then it might be in the better interest of the child to keep this child with the mother in prison under the condition that there are, uh, that these are open prisons with uh, uh, well-equipped uh, mother-child units and also that finally the child should be released together with the mother. But the most important um, recommendation is, and that comes also from the African, um, from the African Convention on the Rights and Welfare of the Child and South African uh, beautiful judgments of the South African Constitutional Court that the main principle should be, and I think there is some kind of awareness now among the judiciary, that when you are sentenced, sen when you are going to sentence a mother of dependent children, uh, where she is the primary caregiver and no other persons can really take care, you should not sentence her to a prison term. There might be house arrest, there might be other forms of punishment, and that needs to be taken into account uh, by the sentencing uh, judges. I think that's the most important recommendation. Migration detention, this is a very conservative. In general, I should say all our figures are scientifically proven. 
but they are very conservative. When we use figures, we know this is 100% sure, but in reality, it's much higher. The same is with this 330,000. That's a very low conservative estimate, but it's 330,000 too much. Because in migration, related detention, and that's a clear finding of the global study which follows what the Committee on the Rights of the Child has said several times, what the Committee on the uh, Rights of uh, Migrant Workers and their Families has said, what UNICEF has said, what the High Commissioner for Refugees has said, IOM, High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Secretary General, whoever, that there are always alternatives so that means migration-related detention of children can never be a measure of last resort. They always violate Article 37B of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. If you have a very dangerous child who committed a serious crime, who is dangerous to himself or to others, uh, there might be no alternative and you might keep this child in pretrial detention also um, in, in imprisonment, uh, but for a, a migrant child who is migrating with his or her families or as an unaccompanied minor, there are always alternatives in group homes, etc. Uh, so this, uh, it, it's very compelling. So there we say migration-related detention of children is simply violating international law. Uh, and that's a, a, a very strong recommendation. States should decriminalize irregular entry, stop immigration detention, and always apply non-custodial solutions, in particular also because the impacts on the health of those children is worst. Because they already, if they are refugee children, they already had, were traumatized in their countries of origin. They might have been further traumatized on the way. Think about those children that are now uh, going through the Sahara from Sub-Saharan Africa to North Africa, uh, or then via the Mediterranean trying to come to Europe, etc. So you have so many traumatizing experiences and then you are arriving finally in Europe and you are again put in a, what they call hotspot in Greece, that means a detention in, in the European Union. No, that should be abolished. In armed conflict, uh, we are talking about 35 children. These are all annual figures. And uh, when we finalize the global study, out of those 35 are 29,000 children that are related somehow to the Islamic State, uh, ISIS. And uh, that means partly children that were voluntarily, under quotation marks, joining uh, ISIS because they were recruited by the internet, uh, but also families that are going there with small children, five, six year old children were brought to the Caliphate. Children were born in the Caliphate and now they are detained either in Baghdad or in the northern part of Syria by the Kurdish authorities and uh, nobody knows really what should happen with them. The conditions are appalling and many European states and other states are not actually willing to take them back because they are terrorists. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a real problem. Um, so again, child soldiers and others who are connected uh, to armed conflict should not be seen primarily as perpetrators but as victims. They are still children. They were in a circle of violence. They were recruited violently by non-state armed groups and afterwards they were detained by the military because of their involvement with armed groups. They should be seen as victims and should be handed back. Uh, there are handover protocols and in some states we have these best practices that are handed over to UNICEF or to child welfare uh, in order to re de-radicalize them and reintegrate them into uh, society. And the same is with national security. This is again a very, very low figure of 1,500 uh, children outside of armed conflict. Um, and of course, that's partly also 
to because national security laws that were enacted in so many countries in reaction to 9-11 and, uh, uh, and uh, the different Security Council resolutions are going very, very far uh, and also uh, membership or advocacy for uh, terrorist groups might lead that these children are actually detained and often brought to before military courts um, and uh, again they should be treated primarily as victims and not as, as perpetrators. So that brings me to the final recommendations, of course, significantly reduce the number. The aim would be to abolish as far as possible detention of children by addressing the root causes and that's the main recommendation to invest much more not into prisons and institutions but into supporting the families. That's the most important. Families are often simply not able to care for their children and they should be su supported. The child welfare system should take up much of the responsibilities that are currently in the, in the uh, child justice system. Uh, if it's really absolutely unavoidable, short is the appropriate period of time. We still have life imprisonment for children. Children who committed offenses when they were 14, 15 years might be sent to life imprisonment. A couple of uh, Islamic states even have still the, the death penalty, although it's absolutely prohibited under international law. Uh, listen to children, it's again a lesson, very, very important to also involve them in developing action plans uh, on how to reduce uh, deprivation of liberty, um, increase the um, monitoring mechanisms such as the national preventive mechanisms uh, when they are established under OPCAT to also ensure that they have a strong child rights competence, uh, education and training, and of course, last but not least, uh, the data collection. Uh, this is a first step, but we need to collect on a regular basis in all states reliable data on the actual number uh, of, of children deprived of liberty. Um, and uh, we are now in this middle of the dissemination follow-up initiation process. We developed global study toolkits with best practices of states uh, where other states can learn from. So in order to uh, assist governments but also uh, UN agencies and, uh, and non-governmental organizations uh, in order to implement the uh, recommendations of the global study. I thank you very much. Uh, this is simply uh, the first step in the possible aim of liberating millions of children in order to leave nobody behind and nobody behind bars. Thank you very much.